give you a second to turn there before we open with a word of prayer. Genesis 47. And, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get going. Lord, we do thank you for the day. Thank you for uh, the sunshine we had today. And Lord, we pray as we uh, cover the last few chapters here in the book of Genesis, you give us wisdom and understanding and things that we learn. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless uh, the classes and the Spanish ministry going on tonight that you would, uh, you would be glorified and uplifted uh, through uh, the teaching and preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, uh, last week we were in Genesis 47, and Jacob and his family have arrived in Egypt. Jacob had presented himself before Pharaoh, um, and we looked at, the, uh, we'll just probably just pick it up in verse 11 just to get back in the flow of things. Um, Jacob is 130 years old, and uh, he, he's not getting any younger, but uh, he'll live another 17 years in Egypt before he dies. And his uh, death story, his deathbed, um, the record of his, his deathbed events are, I think, my favorite. Um, just in, when we get there, you'll see why that is, I think. Verse 11, And Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, and Pharaoh, as Pharaoh had commanded him. And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. Remember, we're, we're in the second year of the famine. That's when Joseph's family comes. J Joseph had told his brothers, go get dad. There's five more years of famine. That's how, it's a pretty simple math problem at that point. So we know we're in the second year of famine. We know there's five more years of famine. The scripture gives us a brief record. Uh, but again, jo Joseph's family will settle in Goshen, which is in what they call Lower Egypt, which is up in the north, bordering the Mediterranean Sea, where the Nile River uh, kind of branches out, and it's a very fertile land and land that floods uh, a couple of times a year, or it did back then, flooded a couple of times a year and replenished the soil and made sure there was plenty of water. This area would have still been an area where crops could grow um, just as long as the Nile River had water in it. Um, they could still grow some crops. Not enough to feed a nation, but there would still be some, uh, there'd be still some possibility of uh, uh, reaping some, you know, some wheat or some uh, something else out of that area. Again, as long as there was enough water in the Nile to uh, facilitate that, and I, and I don't know what that status was, but presumably, if there was anywhere in Egypt you could grow anything, this would Goshen would be the the land that you could do it in. Um, <clears throat> It says in verse 14, Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan for, uh, for the corn which they brought, and Joseph brought uh, the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money failed in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came into Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why shall we die in thy presence, for the money faileth. Okay, so as, um, as the famine goes on, um, you know, they, they've got food sources, they've got that food supply because of Joseph's stewardship. Um, they have plenty of food stored up, but there, this is not a welfare program. Um, and, and honestly, the best way to conserve resources is not to give it away. When you give things away, people abuse it and people take advantage of it. When people have to pay for it, that's a whole different ball game. And some, when you have skin in the game, that's when you take better care of things. Uh, it's why I don't, I don't particularly care for any of the welfare programs that we have that the government funds, whether it be subsidized housing or subsidized phones or subsidized internet or subsidized food or subsidized anything else. I don't particularly care for it because typically when you give things to people, people don't take very good care of it and waste it. Um, and, uh, and I think that's contrary to, um, contrary to the scripture where it says if a man will not work, it doesn't say cannot, but will not work, he shall not eat uh, or he should not eat. And uh, I believe very much in exchanging work for money, not sloth for money. 
I'm not, again, not talking about disability. I'm talking about, I'm talking about just, I'm breathing, therefore I'm entitled to something. Um, and the biblical value is you're entitled to only that which you worked for. That's it. That's all you're entitled to. You're not entitled to free health care. You're not entitled to a free phone or free internet or free food or anything else. You're entitled to what you work for. And if you don't work for it, you're not entitled to it. And if you don't want to work, starve to death. That's your choice. That's compassion. Because we've seen what the welfare state has done, and we've spent over $20 trillion on the war on poverty. Uh, we have the same level of poverty uh, that we did before, except now that we have about half of the children born in America are born to unwed mothers, which means our prisons are exploding, the divorce rate is high, crime is out of control, and most kids that graduate now can't read their diploma. So uh, that's worked out very poorly. All this compassion has turned people into slaves to the government, which was the goal in the first place. Don't get me started on that. So all the money failed. They brought all the money. I mean, literally, Pharaoh had all of the money. Um, they didn't print money in those days. Money was made from precious metals. And when the supply of precious metals ran out and the supply of money ran out, guess what? There was no more money. And people literally were, I mean, there was just no more money. And when you live in an agrarian society and there's been now three years with no income from producing crops, the money dries up pretty quickly. And the whole country, even Canaan, uh, the, the promised land, uh, there was no money because they had brought it all to Egypt to buy food. And they were out of money, and they still had years to go in the famine, so that's a problem. Verse 15, when the money failed in the land of Egypt, in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came into Joseph and said, give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence, for the money faileth? They said, we don't have any money, give it to us. And Joseph said, give your cattle, and I will give you give you for your cattle if money failed. So, um, you know, he said, well, if you don't have money, uh, you, if you've got cattle, I'll exchange food for cattle. And again, they probably would have slaughtered a lot of the cattle by this point just because they, there's just not enough food for them. Um, culling a herd is something you do in times of extreme famine. Um, or extreme drought, especially in these days, cattle need food and they need water. And if those things are in scarce supply, you're going to cull the herd and eat the meat. Um, and, and so, okay, what's whatever's left of the cattle? And, um, and it says again in verse 17, they brought their cattle unto Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for the flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for the asses, and he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. And when the year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord also hath our herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate." And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh. So Pharaoh had all the money, he had all the cattle, now he has all the land. But the other choice was dying. So what's your life worth? I always find it funny when people whine and complain how I'm supposed to do something because their life is supposed to have value. I'm supposed to do things that they're not willing to do for themselves. And to that I say, well, if you're, you don't value your own life enough to go out and work for it, I'm certainly not going to place that value on your life. Get off your lazy butt and go do something. And, and, and at least these people are saying, hey, we're... <laughs> We're not here for welfare. We'll do what we have to. We want to we survive this. We'll worry about the rest later. Okay? Um, and so, um, verse 21, And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end. Therefore, only the land of the priests bought he not. For the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh, and did eat their portion with Pharaoh, uh, which Pharaoh gave them. Wherefore, they sold not their lands. 
And Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land. For Pharaoh, lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the increase that ye shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, or 20%, and four parts shall be your own for seed of the field and for your food and for them of your house, uh, your households and for food for your little ones. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. Um, they were just happy to be saved. Uh, you know, in America, if, we, if McDonald's runs out of chicken nuggets, they're calling 911. Because we know nothing of privation. I mean, we just don't. Unless, unless you're old enough to have lived through the Great Depression, you really don't know what privation is. You come from a foreign country that didn't have anything. You don't, you don't know what it is to want. You really don't. You, you, the only time we're hungry is when we're dieting and we're you know, deliberately not eating. The same country that claims we have an epidemic of food insecurity also has an epidemic of obesity among children. So I'm struggling to find how that can be reconciled. We really don't. I mean, if you want to know what being hungry looks like, there are many places in the world you could go to and, and find out what that's like. Where you, people rummage through garbage cans to find food to eat. I mean, that's, that's a lot of the world. That's, I mean, that's not, those aren't one-offs. That's a lot of the world is like that. We throw away more, more food than some people see in a year. And because of that, we have grown increasingly generation after generation hate to say it, starting with the baby boomers through my generation and now the next generation coming up that think somebody ought to do for them and they ought to have. And if they don't have the newest iPhone, then somebody in the government should do something about that. And it's because we just have never really truly known want. But it's coming. I, I, I think we'll be out of here before it gets that bad. But it's coming to uh, the West. And when the electricity goes off in the West, it's not going to take long for people to die. Because nobody knows how, I mean, relatively speaking, nobody knows how to do anything for themselves. And if they don't have electricity, they don't have the internet. And if they can't watch a YouTube video, they probably don't know how to do it. I mean, how do you order DoorDash when you have no internet or electricity? Okay, so I, I look at America and I say, you know, whenever you feel ungrateful, you should consider scraping some money together and go visiting a third world. Go, to a, go on a missions trip to Honduras sometime. Go, visit, go on a missions trip and, and work with Brother Richie for a week. That'll change your view real quick. So they're suffering. Joseph kept them alive. He did right by Pharaoh. He didn't give away Pharaoh's food. Well, people have a right to eat. Again, no, they don't. Food is not a right. Not in the Bible, it's not. When Adam sinned, God told Adam, from the sweat of your brow, you're going to bring forth bread. You know what the curse of sin means? It means you've got to work to eat. Food is no longer a right. It's no longer a privilege. It's no longer a right that you're entitled to. It was in the Garden of Eden until sin entered the picture. The Garden gave Adam everything that he could have wanted without any work at all. And after he sinned, God said, you know what? If you got time to sin, you got time to sweat, buddy. Uh, and I'm going to make sure, and, and just to make sure you get plenty of sweat in, I'm going to curse the ground just to make it that much harder. And so food, housing, you know, we got people think housing is a right. No, it's not. You, you want to buy the material and build it yourself? Okay, that's one thing. But why is it, and whose job is it to make sure you have a house? It's the government's. 
Well, that would, our, uh, government of the people, by the people. So what you're saying, it's my job to make sure you have a house. No, no, it's not. Well, you're a Christian. You're supposed to love people. I do love people. But I work too hard for my own money to give it to somebody who's just lazy, who wasted my time and tax money in school and didn't learn how to do anything other than say, do you want fries with that? And I'm, I have no, no trouble going by every single one of those panhandlers and not giving them a dime. Because 99, 99 out of 100 of them, I can guarantee you, and if you ever want to challenge me on this, let's round up five and go to get a drug test. They're all on drugs or alcohol. That's why they're homeless, and that's why they're on the street corner. And you can tell the ones that are on meth. You can tell the ones that are on cocaine. You can tell the ones that booze it up. You, you can just look at them and tell what their drug of choice is. If you've been around addicts long enough, it's pretty easy to tell what you're on. And hey, whenever you're hungry enough to say, you know what? This, this hog slop is pretty bad. I think I'm going to go back home and get myself cleaned up. That's the most compassionate thing you can do. Until they want the help, you can't help them. And giving them money doesn't help them. Just wasting your money. My opinion, do what you want. It's your money. I work too hard for mine. Give it away to drug addicts. It's not, and it's not, that's not un, in, uncompassionate because there's no end, end of the drug addicts at the end of the exit sign, exit ramp with the sign. There's no end to them. I could give away all my money that I need for my own family and it wouldn't make a bit of difference. All it would do is increase the flow of drugs into our state. It's sad. And this is tragic. It's sad. These people have... Now, uh, they're alive, and they're going to get to work their farms, but they're going to be working for Pharaoh. But they get to keep 80% of what they produce on Pharaoh's land with Pharaoh's seeds. So that's actually not a bad deal. The, again, the alternative was you, you watch your family starve to death. And I don't know about you, but I, I think the Egyptians made a good deal. Um, so you moved a lot of the people to the cities, it's easier to take care of people in the cities. It's easier to group people together if, you're, if you have to take care of people. Um, he kept the land of the priests, uh, or the, the priests kept their land. He didn't buy that because Pharaoh had given it to them. Pharaoh fed the priests. So, um, Verse 24, and it shall come to pass in the increase that you should give the fifth part. Oh, we already read that. Um, verse 25, and they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth part except the land of the priests only, which became not Pharaoh's. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the whole age of Jacob was 140 and seven years. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. But I will die with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. And he said, Swear unto me, and he swear unto him, and Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. Now, uh, Jacob will go through blessing uh, everybody. And uh, if you skip with me to the end of chapter 49, we'll come back to the blessings here in a minute. But I, I told you I love this story. But in verse 33, Jacob's blessed all his children and says, And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his feet. Isn't that awesome? God has his whole family there. He goes through. He blesses everybody. When he's done blessing, he kind of helps drag his feet up into the bed, and he pulls the covers up over him, and he lays down, and he goes, to, he goes into eternity. <laughs> That's it. And that the, I mean, if you could go anyway, is that not the way you want to go? I mean, the way Elijah went wasn't bad either, you know, being taken up in a whirlwind. That'd be pretty cool. Um, 
you know. But if you can't go in the rapture, uh, then if you can only go by death, uh, this is the way you'd want to do it. Call your family. Hey, I think my time is here. Call your family together. Say your last words to every single one of them when you're all done. Just lay in bed and close your eyes and go see the Lord. I mean, that would be that would be tremendous. So I love this. Contrast that with Isaac, who thought he was going to die and lived another 43 years after that. He thought he was going to die, blessed his children, and then lived for four decades. He, he lived after he thought he was going to die, about as long as I've been on the earth myself. Uh, just to put that into perspective for you. Um, so Jacob, Jacob, I think, uh, at this point in his life, uh, had a strong relationship with the Lord. And uh, the, the men who tended to know, uh, tended to spend a lot of time with the Lord, tended to know when their time was up. They tended to know when the Lord was getting ready to take them. Uh, and uh, the ones who didn't have a real strong relationship with the Lord tended not to. My observation, it's a general observation, you can't apply it to everybody, but Do you ever just feel kind of creepy and you'll just want to read, you know, the death of all these people? You'll, you'll see certain things that stand out. Uh, verse, um, verse 40, uh, chapter 48, verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me, and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I make of thee a multitude of people, and I will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. So he's recounting from Genesis 28 when um, the Lord appeared to him uh, and, and talked to him. And uh, he recounts what the Lord had promised to him. And it says, Verse 5, And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. So what he's doing is he's saying, we're going to count Ephraim and Manasseh as equal heirs to my other sons. Uh, so even though they're my grandsons, they're going to be treated in the inheritance as if they are my son. Joseph needed no inheritance, and Joseph was not going to be um, be leaving Egypt. He was, he was going to be living an Egyptian life, and there is no tribe of Joseph. Um, but Ephraim and Manasseh are tribes, and they're brought in by Jacob at this moment. Verse 6, And thy issue, which thou begettest after them, shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren and their inheritance. As for me, when I came from uh, Padan, um, and we... we Padanaram is also what uh, the other the uh, wilderness of Padan. Um, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way when yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath, uh, and I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, uh, the same as Bethlehem. And Israel, and they didn't call it Bethlehem until much later, but Moses is inserting that so we know what city he's talking about because it ceased to be known that. Uh, as Ephrath um, between Genesis and somewhere in the time of the judges, or not the judges, the, um, the wilderness wandering. Uh, verse 8, And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see, and he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. Now Jacob is in the same position his father was. He, he can't see. His eyes are bad. He might have cataracts, uh, you know, might be some other issue going on. But he's, he's virtually blind. He cannot even recognize people because his eyesight is so poor at this point. Um, he asked the same question his father asked of him, Who art thou, my son? I am Esau, thy eldest. So Jacob is in a position where maybe at this moment these things are rolling through his mind. But he is not that man anymore. Um, 
So he kisses and embraces his, his two grandsons. Verse 11, And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God has shown me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took both them, uh, took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. So Joseph assumed that oldest would be the first blessed, and firstborn, first blessed. That's the way it was typically done. Joseph assumed that. So as Jacob's laying in the bed, Joseph brings uh, Manasseh, the older, to Jacob's right hand, assuming Jacob would put the primary blessing on him, and Ephraim to the left, so that the secondary blessing would go to him. And Jacob, as he's laying there, unable to see, assumes that that's what Joseph will do. And so he reaches across, and he puts his right hand on Ephraim's head, and he reaches across, and he puts his left hand on Manasseh's head, and Joseph is none too pleased by this. Um, And it says in verse 15, And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil. Now you notice in your Bible that word angel is capitalized. He's talking about the angel that he wrestled with. The Bible just uh, very clearly calls that angel God. In fact, the name of the place is that... I have seen God face to face. Okay, so um, he's he's talking about the Lord here, which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head and the Manasseh's head. Whoa, just because you're second in command of all the world doesn't mean you get to move dad's hands here. Um, And dad's going to call him out and say, whoa, you might run the world, but you don't run this house. Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people. And he also shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, And thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh, and Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite, with my sword and with my bow. So Jacob blesses, he, he elevates the younger over the older. Um, of course, that, you know, if you look at it, that's a family tradition. Uh, God elevated Isaac over Ishmael, even though technically Ishmael was older, he was not the son of promise. Uh, and then God elevated Jacob over Esau, uh, even though they were twins born minutes apart, Jacob was still technically the younger. And God elevated Jacob, and so here Jacob elevates um, Ephraim over Manasseh uh, and blesses them both and and gives them uh, an an inheritance. Kind of a prophetic way indicates that they would be large tribes, uh, that they they would have the largest populations, um, and they would actually have a greater portion among the children of Israel in the promised land. So... um, so he, he does give them a blessing. All right, let's go through chapter 49 real quick. Um, there's a lot of prophetic things in here, and I'm just honest enough to tell you I, I don't know the significance of some of these things. So uh, I, I've read some things on them. I didn't like what the other people wrote, and I just decided I would just say, I don't know, uh, instead of, trying to uh, make something ultra-spiritual out of it. Um, But chapter 49, Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, and I tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together, and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. 
Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as waters thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it, and he went up to my couch. So Reuben is the oldest. The blessing is actually more of a curse. Reuben had gone in uh, and laid with one of his father's concubines, and, um, and because of that, he was essentially cursed. Though he was the beginning of, of the tribes, he was the oldest, uh, and all that, joke, Jacob told him he'd be unstable as water because of what he had done. Uh, verse 5, Simeon and Levi, our brethren, instruments of cruelty, are in their habitations. O my soul, came not thou into their secret, unto their assembly? Mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So, because of them, and remember, Dinah had been defiled, and so they, they concocted a scheme and talked to talk the men of the city into being circumcised. They waited to the third day while they were convalescing, and then they went in and killed them all. And uh, Jacob remembered that and, and cursed their anger. Um, and even though the tribe of Levi would be chosen to, um, uh, to be the priestly line and to go about the things of the Lord, minister in the tabernacle and that, um, they, uh, they, they are kind of lumped together. Levi would not get, get an inheritance in the promised land. They would get possession of some cities within the other tribal allotments, but they would not have an area just for the tribe of Levi, and they would be scattered among the other tribes, uh, and that's part of, um, part of their curse here. Um, he gets to Judah. Judah, thou art, uh, verse 8, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down and crouched as a lion, and as an old lion, uh, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver uh, from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and an uh, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and he clothed his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. Um, that's where it stops. Um, but Judah, he's the first to receive actually a real blessing, uh, what, you, what they would expect when, when they were being blessed by their father. Uh, he was elevated uh, as the strongest among the tribes. He would be, um, uh, it would be where the, the scepter, the ruling would come from. This would be first seen in David and would continue through to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, unto the time of Shiloh, just means at the time of peace. Um, and uh, that ultimately Jesus Christ, he is the Prince of Peace. Uh, that's what Isaiah prophesied his name would be. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's the one that will ultimately bring peace and establish his kingdom. And so from the time, from the time of the scepter until the time of peace, uh, Judah uh, would have it and run with it and go. And, and so that's a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, just how God would bless them. Uh, Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea, and, they, uh, and he shall be for a haven of ships, and his border shall be unto Sidon. Uh, Really, his only blessing is just telling where he's going to live when they get to the promised land, 413 years hence. Um, Issachar would be next. Uh, Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens, and he saw that rest was good and the land that it was pleasant and bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. Uh, not exactly a, a um, real stunning a blessing here, basically, that... Issachar would be a, uh, be a servant and um, be, be one of the weaker tribes. Um, Dan, verse 16, Dan, uh, Dan shall judge his people and one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heels so that his rider shall fall backward. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Now that uh, could be a prophecy related to to um, Samson, who was a, tri uh, a judge from the tribe of Dan. Um, 
the rest of it I can't explain to you, except I don't know that I would want to be an adder in the path biting horses' heels. That wouldn't be what I'd want to be known for. Um, Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. Uh, verse 20, out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. Um, this is an uh, indication that his apportionment would be in the north part of the promised land, and it would be a prosperous portion. Uh, verse 21, Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth uh, goodly words. Um, a hind is a doe, um, and, and Deborah, who was a judge, she was from the tribe of Naphtali. Uh, you could apply this promise to her in a prophetic sense. Beyond that, I can't tell you. Um, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him, but his bow abode in strength and his arm, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, even by the God of thy father who shall help thee, and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast and of the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors, under the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Um, he mentions Joseph here, gives him the largest blessing. His blessings would be from heaven and earth. They would exceed those of Abraham and Isaac. <clears throat> and uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, as we mentioned, would receive uh, the, the largest portion um, together in the, in the allotments. And then finally, Benjamin shall, uh, verse 27, Benjamin shall uh, raven as a wolf in the morning, he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. Um, and uh, Benjamin was a small tribe. Israel's history uh, shows that they were a very strong tribe. Uh, with 26,000 soldiers from the tribe of Benjamin, they defeated an army of 400,000, um, and that's in Judges chapter 20. So their, their prowess in battle, their strength, in warfare um, uh, was something to be desired, but they, would, they were pretty much always the smallest um, numerically as far as the tribes went. Um, and so, at, again, at the end, all these, verse 28, are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is, this is it, that their father spake unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. And he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a bearing. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. And so ends the history of Jacob and the record of Jacob, also Israel, um, as, as he dies there. And then chapter 20, just kind of, or chapter 50, I'm sorry, um, just kind of finishes everything off. Um, Jacob dies and... It says, and Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept, him, uh, wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. And 40 days were fulfilled for him, for so, the, they, so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. So 70 days, they, they did a day of mourning. It was 40 days for the embalming, 30 days of mourning after that. Uh, that was um, quite remarkable for the, all of Egypt to be mourning over a Hebrew, a shepherd, a cattle herder, um, but he was Joseph's father, and the country revered Joseph uh, greatly um, because he had saved them from the famine. Uh, it says in verse 4, And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If I now have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die. In my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there thou shalt bury me. Now, therefore, let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father, according as he made thee swear. And Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, 
the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all the house of Joseph, and his brethren, and his father's house. Only their little ones, and their flocks, and their herds left they in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan, and where they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, they said, This is a grievous mourning to the Egyptian. Wherefore, the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. And his sons did unto him according as he commanded. For his sons carried him unto the land of Canaan, and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought with the field for a possession of a burying place of Ephraim the Hittite before Mamre. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of their servants of the God of thy father. Uh, and Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. For I, am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring it to pass, as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived a 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation, the children also of Maker, the son of Manasseh, were brought up uh, upon Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. And Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. That's where the beginning ends, with Joseph being placed in the tomb. Real quickly, some comparisons. Um, Joseph being a, a picture of Christ. Uh, it's in the Genesis notebook, if you have that, page 84. Um, both Christ and Joseph regarded themselves as shepherds. Both were beloved of their fathers. Both were hated by their brethren without cause. Both were sent uh, by their fathers to their brethren. Both were plotted against by their brethren. Both were stripped of their robes. Both were taken to Egypt. Both were sold for the price of a slave. Both experienced God's presence through it all. Both were severely tempted. Both were falsely accused. Both were bound. Both remained silent and offered no defense. Both were respected by their jailers. Both were placed with two prisoners. One was lost, the other saved. Both were highly exalted after their sufferings. Both took non-Jewish brides. Both were 30 at the beginning of their ministries. Both were visited and honored by all earthly nations. Both were lost to their brethren for a while. Both forgave and restored their repentant brother. A lot of comparison between Joseph and Christ. Again, he is the only, one of the only characters in the Bible that we have a, a real record of his life, and nothing negative is said about him. So, anybody have any questions? All right. Of course I did. I left my bulletin on my desk. That's okay. Um, so just a couple things uh, coming up. Um, Carla, did, did we get the cleaning thing settled, settled yet? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so praise the Lord, that is settled. Um, Sunday, with our missionaries being here, we're going to have a potluck with um, Brother Jones after church. So if you're planning on uh, bringing any food, would you let Shannon know? Uh, if you could let her know tonight, that would be helpful. 
Um, sooner rather than later. Sooner is better. Um, now is good. Sooner is better. Um, but uh, yeah, that's coming up this weekend. Uh, so Brother Jones will be here uh, at 10 o'clock. He'll give us an update and explain about his ministry. If, if you've joined the church since I've been here, then you haven't met him probably and don't know what he does. Um, this will be your chance to uh, cash in on that and find out. It'll be my first chance meeting him and getting to hear that. Brother um, uh, Sturtz will be here in the evening, uh, so uh, we won't be doing any food or anything. He, he comes periodically. He's based here in the state, so he comes by. Uh, he's been here already a couple times, but wanted to update us, was coming through the area. I said, sure, why not? Um, that would be great. So they, they will both be here this weekend. Um, next weekend is the men's conference, not this one coming up, but the next one. I want to encourage you guys to, if you haven't, go online and, and register for that. would love to have you come. Uh, if you want a carpool or anything like that, let us know. And if you need, uh, have any questions about reservations, wherever we're staying in that I would be happy to answer those for you. They're in the email, too, if you want to look at that. But I'd be happy to um, uh, touch base with you on that. Um, I haven't gotten a confirmation of a day, but weather permitting, uh, one day next week, uh, they'll be um, re redoing the parking lot, fixing the parking lot. So they just finished all the compaction that's required today so that it won't settle or sink on us make that parking lot look bad. Um, so, uh, so that's all done, and uh, we look forward to uh, getting that fixed sometime next week. So hopefully the weather will cooperate. Um, it won't be on a Wednesday that they're doing it for obvious reasons, but um, we will, uh, uh, I'll keep you informed on that. But when they are doing it, just plan on not being here, give them room to work. All right. Seed line tomorrow. Uh, Lots of stapling. Not much tabbing left to do. Um, not much to tab. So uh, all those things are, uh, are coming up. I'm trying to think if there was another announcement I was supposed to give. I think I covered it all. If I didn't read your bulletin, I would. That's all I can do. All right. Um, let's uh, get to our prayer list then tonight and 